Well, good morning. Good morning. Well, first of all, thank you, Ian, and thanks to the Vancouver Board of Trade and everybody here for hosting this and turning out today. I've been looking forward to this, well, even you. if it is the end of my Christmas New Year's break. Yeah. <laughs> I can't think of a better place to start it than here compared to anywhere else in the country at the moment weather-wise, though. Uh, Prime Minister, look first on behalf of all the, the business community uh, gathered here today, all of our members whose em employees comprise about a third of the working people of British Columbia, our 200 plus volunteers and our policy committees, our board and our executive, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we're going to have a conversation today, ladies and gentlemen, primarily focused on, on the economy. And of course, you, you can't come to British Columbia without talking about the, the three Ps. The, those would be you know, pipelines. Uh, the Pacific Gateway, and, and pucks, as in hockey pucks. Uh, and we're going to get to all of those. Uh, okay. But first, I, I would like to start, though, on a, a more of a personal note, if I could. I mean, uh, 2013 ended on a, on a very bittersweet note, uh, and what seemed like uh, an internationally unifying note with the passing of Nelson Mandela. And it was appropriate that uh, you postponed your first visit that was scheduled to be with the Vancouver Board of Trade to lead a delegation of Canadians, including you know, former prime ministers, uh, and thus had a very intimate encounter with a profound and historical moment. Uh, let me ask you, what impact did that experience have on you personally, and what are some of the memories that you're going to take away from being in South Africa at that point? Well, look, as I said when, uh, when former President Mandela passed, um, obviously he's a, a figure of enormous historic significance for all kinds of reasons, but the, I think the biggest single one is that he's... The, the greatest symbol of one of the, you know, one of the most positive political developments of my lifetime, which has been the success in the fight against racial discrimination and racism. And, um, and really, he's obviously an icon in that regard. There's all kinds of other things I can say about the, you know, the tremendous hope he gave to South Africa and the example he set uh, for other uh, leaders in other countries. Um, look, uh, in terms of uh, our own experience, um, uh, my own experience, I was uh, honored to lead a really an unprecedented Canadian delegation of former governor generals, former uh, governors general, former prime ministers, including uh, the Right Honourable Kim Campbell, who is here today. And uh, among the many things we did, we had a, a, a dinner and a conversation on the way there and talked a lot about how our own country has changed and evolved uh, over that period of time. Uh, Largely for the better, largely for the better, and it was uh, it was really a magic moment. Well, and I think the uh, even being ten time zones away, it, it it seemed like a very moving and a very reflective moment. Let's stay on that side of the Atlantic uh, for a minute. Um, on New Year's Eve, uh, your office issued a statement uh, identifying some of the government's significant accomplishments, looking back on, right. on 2013, and clearly among those was highlighted uh, the successful signing of the Canada and European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, let's call it CETA. Right. Uh, now, when we met in the summer, you mentioned both the complexities that still remained on that uh, agreement that still needed some solving uh, in, in what became a very lengthy negotiation, multiple year negotiation process, as well as a clear determination to see it through. Now it's done, and as is mentioned in the introduction, uh, we're sitting in the shadow of the 25th anniversary of the Free Trade Agreement. And uh, we and look NAFTA, at CETA yeah. and the NAFTA. And, yeah. We then ask the question, why should we be so excited about this agreement? What's the big deal about CETA? What does it mean for Canada? How is it different from different trade agreements? And what does it mean for BC? Okay, well, uh, let me try and, try and tackle all of those. First of all, it's the, it's the biggest agreement Canada signed in terms of market access. Uh, the European Union uh, is the largest integrated economic market in the country, notwithstanding the, the challenges it has that we're all very aware of. It is still the wealthiest single market in the world. By getting access to that market, and you know, when this thing comes into effect, we'll have 98% uh, of trade tariff-free. Um, we will then have access, we will be the only G8 nation with essentially tariff-free access to both North America and the European Union. We will have tariff-free access essentially to more than half the world's economy. So this is not just a great opportunity, it is a really a historic thing the country's wanted to see for a long time, and that is the opportunity to diversify our trade away from the United States. This is a, something that has been happening gradually over the past decade, but it is a real opportunity now for our businesses uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, put a, a much more diverse trade face on, uh, on our exports. 
the, the deal itself, I won't get into all the details, the deal itself is also uh, unprecedented in its scope. Uh, it is not just a tariff removal uh, agreement. It touches on services, on investment, on intellectual property, you go through it is probably, uh, you know, next to the European Union itself, probably the most comprehensive trade deal uh, ever signed. The Economist magazine that I don't always quote says it is in fact the, the gold standard for future trade agreements in the world. So this really is a big deal. For British Columbia, look, everybody's, everybody potentially can benefit from this, all parts of the country, because uh, simply of the scope of it, it basically touches on every industry, every opportunity. But in the case of British Columbia, you know, I think offhand of uh, things like uh, forest products, uh, fisheries, uh, products that have, uh, Brit uh, British Columbia is already a substantial exporter of these things to the European Union, but these things face fairly heavy tariffs today. Those tariffs will come off. In most cases, they will come off immediately. Uh, agriculture, another area, um, manufacturing, professional services, there's just, there, there literally is opportunity for every line of business in every sector if it can see those opportunities. We always say with the government, our, our job, at least uh, as conservative, is to open up the doors. We can't, we can't uh, in the end, conclude the actual uh, commercial deals themselves, but we can give people the opportunity to sign those, and there's plenty of opportunity in this. Did the involvement of the subnational governments so of the provinces had a very distinct role in this? How did that change the deal, in your view, and, and did, it, did it make it stronger, or did it, the challenges associated with getting everybody on the same page nationally uh, give more pros than cons, once all was said was done? Well, first of all, it's important to say that the involvement of the provinces in this was essential, mm -hmm. because uh, one of the things the Europeans were seeking, one of their major objectives in this was to get access to subnational procurement in Canada. That was one of their main objectives. And obviously the federal government could not negotiate that on its own. So they were an essential party, and, and once again, that's another area, the involvement of essentially procurement markets, and particularly subnational procurement markets, was really without precedent. But the fact of the matter is, um, you know, it, at the outset, this, would, this looked like it would be complicated and difficult, but uh, for the most part, uh, the 13 provinces and territories were, uh, very cooperative and good partners who, in just about every case, could see the opportunities and could see that the opportunities were much bigger than the obstacles. So it actually worked very well. We obviously faced it with some trepidation given mm -hmm. the complexity. Um, but you know, in the end, I would say that us with our 13 provinces and territories probably was still a little less complicated than the European Union mm -hmm. on the other side of the table, mm -hmm. especially with the current challenges they're facing. Mm -hmm. And going forward then, and looking forward, how has CETA laid the foundation and or set a precedent for the new areas of international trade focus of, of Canada as we go forward from here? Well, as you know, we're still, um, we, one of the things our government has done has been to uh, vastly expand our trade deals and our trade negotiations. When, uh, some of you have heard me say before, when, when we came to office in 2006, you know, it's, it's really quite, it was really quite an incredible situation. In spite of being one of the largest open economies in the world, uh, Canada had trade agreements with only five countries. In, in, in spite of the fact that if you look at the two core trading partners we had, the United States and Mexico, uh, you know, that was a deal, that was one of the first really big post-Cold War globalization trade deals, and yet we had stood still for all intents and purposes for 13 years. So when we came to office, we not only had very few trade linkages uh, in terms of trade agreements, we also had, frankly, very little negotiating capacity at the federal level. So one of the things we have been doing over the past few years was expanding not just our number of trade deals, but expanding our capacity to negotiate. I remember in the early days when we started focusing on some of the smaller deals that we signed in Latin America and elsewhere, I remember um, you know, some saying this isn't worth doing, but part of what I was saying is we had to get the trade capacity, negotiation capacity, back in this country. So we've now gone essentially from five countries we have trade deals with to 42 countries that we have trade deals with, and we have a very active program of ongoing negotiations with Korea, with uh, South Korea, with uh, India, with uh, Japan, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So, look, hopefully this is the beginning of, um, 
of uh, even bigger things to come. But it is, it was the essential step. I mean, essentially breaking out of a, a trade pattern that was just North America focused was really critical for this country. Do you anticipate that in the discussions going forward you'll see more of that subnational involvement or is that a bit of a one-off? Well, you know, look, as I would say it's probably a one-off, but it obviously depends on the mix of issues. We, we will always uh, consult with provinces quite carefully on trade agreements, particularly obviously when we're dealing with their areas of jurisdiction. But where, uh, where trade agreements are not focused primarily on their area of jurisdiction, we likely would not have them at the table. Okay. Let's turn to uh, one of the elephants in the room uh, with respect to pipelines. Um, it feels like we're at a bit of a crossroads at the moment with our energy industry uh, in the country. You've had three significant reports come out in the last month or so. You've had the National Energy Board report on the Northern Gateway Pipeline on December 18th with its 209 conditions. You've had the Doug Aford report that was focused on the Aboriginal and First Nations relationships in pursuing energy projects. And you've had the Houston report on marine oil spill preparedness and response regime, which came out on December the 3rd, and it had 45 recommendations in it. Three reports with an immediate reaction, uh, first of all, after the National Energy Board uh, report uh, from the government of BC saying that they need a year to give a reasonable response, not six months, and a resounding no from various First Nations communities and the environmental community. Um, you know, other than that, there's no problems, I guess. But uh, how, do you, how do you navigate forward from this point uh, for, and, and put a vision out there and pursue it with respect to Canada's energy industry? Well, look, let me just say broadly this, and we've said this many times before. In an era where um, there's energy demand all over the world, where the energy industry has been the engine of much of Canada's economic growth, and also at, at a time where, for various reasons, American demand for energy may fall in the near term, it's without a doubt in the country's interest that we diversify our markets for energy resources. We sell 98, 99% of our energy to one country, the United States, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you know, clearly, as with any business, is not really in our interest. Uh, there's, uh, now, that having said, that's obviously a broad objective, but the government's role uh, is not to you know, endorse particular pipelines or conclude particular energy business projects. Our job as a government is to set up proper processes of evaluation and uh, scrutiny. Um, we have a process of environmental review, National Energy Board and other environmental reviews. The government will follow that process and will take uh, appropriate decisions as it always has. I think in every one of these cases, whether it's energy or other kind of mining projects, the government has always followed the best scientific and expert advice available to us. In terms of things like uh, particular challenges, uh, real challenges, they're not just political challenges, real challenges faced by, uh, for instance, pipeline projects. Uh, our government has committed uh, to making sure that we have uh, rigorous systems of pipeline safety, rigorous systems of uh, marine protection, and that we uh, fully uh, respect our constitutional duties to consult with uh, Aboriginal communities. Uh, we will do uh, all of these things, and we will not approve projects unless uh, they're not only in our economic interest, but also they meet the highest standards of environmental protection. Beyond that, Ian, I'm obviously not going to say anything because uh, we have reports before us now that we have mm -hmm. to act on and take judgments on, and I can't say anything that would prejudice those particular deliberations. Well, you mentioned that our, our key market is the United States, and, and right. uh, as it stands at the moment, that leads you into a, a tangential a question on, on Keystone. I mean, President right. Obama has said no uh, to Keystone. No, and, he's, and, and he's punted. He's punted, oh, fair. Right. Know, the Canadian football league he said, style. He said maybe. He said maybe. And, and you've, you've made it clear that you don't want to take no for an answer. So how yeah. do we square that circle? What's the path forward in that conversation? Well, look, it's ultimately uh, an American process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on this one, of course, the government is at liberty to take a position. But I need to only quote the uh, studies of the U.S. government itself which has said that the project will create tens of thousands of jobs on both sides of the border, uh, that it will obviously enhance energy security uh, because it will essentially displace uh, crude being brought from countries that present longer term 
serious strategic uh, risks to the United States. And uh, the reports have also made clear that the Keystone Pipeline represents uh, negligible to non-existent environmental challenges in the United States itself. So it's my hope that the administration will in due course see its way to take the uh, appropriate decision. But that's obviously a political process in the United States. The good news is that on both sides of the aisle, in both political parties, in both houses, and throughout the American economy and public, there is widespread support for the project. More than two-thirds mm -hmm. of Americans want it to proceed. A majority of members of both houses of Congress want to see the project proceed. I am confident that in due course, I can't put a timeline on that, the project will one way or another proceed. You also spoke on some of the First Nations issues. One of the, uh, the challenges that exist in all of our resource industries, and I think we, we're a little more sensitive to it in BC than other provinces, is the whole issue around treaty rights and title. Right. And uh, the, the elusive word pursued is certainty. The certainty with respect specifically to foreign investment, but also uh, you know, the national investment into our resource industries. How do we send those positive messages and get some of that certainty and at the same, sti at the same time stay out of court with our First Nations and mm -hmm. Aboriginal peoples? Well, look, it's not going to be easy to do all of those things. One of the things we've, we've obviously been trying to do is to create greater certainty and resolve some of these land claim issues. We have, we have uh, succeeded, our government is really the first to succeed in, in actually arriving at a number of treaties in British Columbia. There, there's still many more that are unresolved, but we're actually uh, moving uh, some of them forward. Look, I, I, I believe, I, I like to look at this more than through just the framework of, of treaties and consultation and those constitutional obligations. I, I would hope that in the longer term, the lens we can look through this um, uh, by is really the one of economic opportunity. Um, we have, for the first time in Canadian history, the prospect of significant uh, economic development, resource development, it's not just in British Columbia, but elsewhere in the country, in regions where Aboriginal people are often the dominant populations and where there have been no similar large-scale economic opportunities before. Uh, if handled correctly, this is an unprecedented opportunity for Aboriginal people and their communities to join the mainstream of the Canadian economy without which, in my judgment, we won't make progress on all of the other things, the social issues that we need to make progress on in those communities. And I encourage uh, Aboriginal leaders to look at, this, at these things, not just as opportunities to gain a revenue stream, but opportunities to have people get skilled, uh, to have people working on these projects, to have Aboriginal businesses providing services to these kinds of developments, and ultimately to develop the kind of uh, both human and physical capital that will, will allow for uh, people to participate in similar projects across the country. So I, I will hope that in time, and we see evidence of it in some areas, that uh, uh, communities will see those opportunities. And obviously we will make the investments we need to make in things like skills and in things like business development uh, to uh, allow those communities to have that kind of participation. I think one of the um, side effects of the, uh, the, the elevated interest and activity in the pipeline discussion and the pipeline business at the moment is there seems to be a higher awareness uh, and, and in many cases an education about the history of oil tanker traffic, the history of just how much activity there's been in this industry for going back decades and decades. And there's been shock, I think, in some corners uh, of the broader population, just how many tankers have been going in and out of the Burrard Inlet for decades now. And how many uh, pipelines are and how many all, pipelines all over are, the place. And in, yeah. in many cases, running under people's communities, right? Uh, and, and so there's a, suddenly there's a light switch that seems to have gone on that has ignited the part of this debate. Um, one of those reports, uh, specifically around the marine spill safety, used a phrase that's been repeated often in the media now, and it talked about woefully ill-equipped, was the phrase, woefully inequipped when it came to spill response and the investment needed to, to change that. What are your thoughts on that? And I realize that's early days uh, on, on the report, um, but is there, is there a spirit and is there an appetite of the federal government to address some of those issues that have been identified in these reports? Well, well obviously, that, this is specifically why we commissioned various reports. Mm -hmm. Um, as I said earlier, and I mean it, we want to make sure that these kinds of projects are not just economically um, viable and uh, uh, give us lots of economic prosperity. We want to make sure 
that they are environmentally safe. And we want to make sure that every measure is taken to prevent any kind of uh, serious uh, uh, environmental threat or other kind of, uh, of, of disaster, and in the hopefully rare cases where those happen, that there are adequate responses. So we've commissioned reports specifically to identify all the various steps we need to take. We've taken some already on our own that we'd identified ourselves, but we brought in experts to identify um, the actions we need to take at every single level of the process, and we will take them uh, to ensure uh, that we achieve what we want to achieve. So I'm going to turn to the Pacific Gateway uh, yeah. for a minute. So, uh, and, and forgive uh, a little bit of a preamble here. We would be remiss if we didn't actually take an opportunity as the Vancouver Board of Trade uh, to say thank you for two specific things. The first is the, the action taken on the APEC travel card announcement uh, earlier this year. This, as many people in this room know, that was a specific ask of the Vancouver Board of Trade uh, that, was a, uh, that finally, uh, frankly, took the form of a, a national resolution that got passed at the Canadian Chamber meeting about two years ago. Uh, and secondly, the ongoing progress with respect to air liberalization uh, or air access liberalization in Canada, 26 international air access agreements in, in 2013. These issues remain a very, very significant priority for the Vancouver Board of Trade. So uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't pause for a minute to say on behalf of our policy council and our membership, thank you for those, uh, those two items. Um, we also were pleased to see the announcement around the $50 billion investment in the Building Canada Fund over the next 10 years because the efforts in the gateway investment over the last decade, uh, in my view, have, have produced a, a hallmark of infrastructure investment success. And, and this is a bit of a long laundry list here, so forgive me, but I think it's, it's a, it, it makes the point. Uh, if you look at this list here, you've got the Caribou Connector, the Kicking Horse Canyon, the South Fraser Perimeter Road, uh, you've got the Port-au-Prince Prince Rupert, which has just had a record year, 22 and a quarter million tonnes of cargo. Uh, record levels of potash out of Saskatchewan uh, agricultural products in the Manitoba and Ontario, $475 million a day going in and out of Port Metro Vancouver, and 227,000 tons going in and out of uh, YVR uh, in last year alone. So two points and a question. Point number one. I'm um, not sure I need to say anything. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, the, the question's coming. Just wait. <laughs> the, the two points are that, I mean, this is obviously an unprecedented degree of cooperation and partnership. Right particularly and specifically involved in the private sector. And the second point, which is the main one, it's, it's worked. It's, the, the list here shows it's worked. So the question then becomes, looking forward, um, where does the Pacific Gateway factor into your priorities as you contemplate how to spend that $50 billion going <coughs> forward? Well, it will obviously be a significant factor. First of all, it's, it's actually more than 50 when you include a direct investments in federal infrastructure. We're going to be in the area of about $70 billion. This is the largest single infrastructure uh, set of investments in Canadian history. Um, we just came off what was previously the largest set, the previous Building Canada Fund, a significant portion of which went to uh, the Asia Pacific Gateway. And it will continue to be a priority because, um, look, we've, we, we've kind of identified, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of international trade, three broad priorities two of which we've moved forward on very aggressively, and those are trade agreements we've had with uh, the Americas and, and obviously now with Europe. But the really big one is to get uh, increased trade to Asia because we do know that in the next century that is where uh, the largest portion of global growth is going to be. It is already and it will continue to be that for some decades to come. And we know that uh, we have a special advantage in Canada because no part of the Western Hemisphere of the Americas is closer to Asian markets than mm -hmm. is British Columbia, uh, the coast of British Columbia. Uh, so this is where we want to make the substantial investments necessary to take advantage of all the opportunities and all the resource and other growth opportunities we have in Asia. So there, these are the two big things we need to do to exploit uh, our, uh, our opportunities in Asia. One is uh, trade agreements and our global commerce strategy around that, and the second is the physical infrastructure on the West Coast. So uh, without getting into details, those will continue to be, that will continue to be a major priority going forward. Do you have a sense of when those details might start coming out? No, um, obviously these things are uh, the subject of, you know, fairly elaborate negotiations with uh, provinces, municipalities, and various port authorities to try and establish where 
particularly when we're talking about big international focused infrastructure, where the bottlenecks are most likely to be and how to kind of proactively uh, resolve those uh, before they develop. So let me give you a, uh, an empty canvas to work with here for a sec. Um, we're early days of 2014. Um, let's, uh, when you consider the broad Canadian economy and, and, uh, and, and looking out over the, the, the next year, how satisfied are you with the overall state of the economy? The state of the economy? Yeah. Well, first of all, look, I think, I think, Ian, it's important for me to repeat what I have been saying for five years now, and then I'll qualify it. What I have been saying is we, the biggest, the biggest reality we face as a country <clears throat> is that we're a relatively small open economy in a world that remains wrought with economic uncertainty. Um, and we will be inevitably uh, buffeted to some degree by the uh, uncertainties and the up ups and downs of the economy around us. Uh, that said, Canada's economic fundamentals are very strong. I won't go through all of those. I think people know them here, the banking sector, the fiscal situation, the strength of our labor force, other things. We're in a relatively strong position, and our government is determined to do all of the things necessary to strengthen us, whether it's in you know, areas like innovation or infrastructure or a more responsive immigration system. We are doing all of the things that we think are necessary to exploit the opportunities uh, before us. But it is a challenged global economy. That said, you know, as we move into 2014, I'm, I'm a little more optimistic this year than I've been in past years. I think that Europe, while its challenges are longer term, has, you know, kind of hit the, the trough and is beginning to come back. I see real evidence of, um, of growth taking hold in the United States. It's not going to be a boom. And there are certainly longer term challenges there with fiscal and other situations <clears throat> that are going to have to be addressed. But you know, I do think that 2014 um, is likely to present some good opportunities for our country. And if we keep our focus, if, if we do two things in this country, if we keep our focus on the economy and we retain our relative degree of political stability and ability to make decisions, which is not the case in many other Western countries, that I am quite optimistic for Canada over the longer term. But the medium term, as we all know, uh, given the problems that are out there, uh, presents unknown risks. So on a related point, um, your government is on a fiscal plan. Right. Um, reports over the weekend uh, echo confidence in, in achieving the objectives that you put out in your fiscal plan. What is the source of that confidence? And what are the risks that, that, that exist out there to it? Well, look, we, we said in the last election we would balance the budget over the course of this mandate and we would do so really uh, in two ways. One was an assumption of, of quite modest, quite modest revenue growth, and the other was um, modest reductions over the medium term in government spending. We've achieved the latter. Um, income growth has actually been a lower, little bit slower than we'd hoped. Um, not so much because uh, economic growth hasn't been uh, where we wanted. It's been approximately what we thought it would be. It's been that our inflation rate has been so low that the government's actual nominal mm -hmm. income from which we gain revenue has been a little bit slower than anticipated. But look, we're broadly speaking on track um, uh, with, with, even modest, uh, with an even modest uh, economic performance over the next year. We will achieve a balanced budget by 2015, as we said. And uh, I, I, I try to encourage people not to get ahead of us and figure out all the ways we're going to spend the surplus <laughs> before we actually get it. But the first, uh, the first challenge will be to balance the budget, uh, which we're on track to do, and importantly, on track to do without raising taxes on Canadian families, businesses, and individuals. And that is really Canada's big advantage going forward. What about the productivity conundrum? I mean, we hear about this all the time, and yeah. it's, it's, it's like trying to capture smoke in your hands sometimes, to wrap your hands around what this issue means for the, the, for the business leaders in this room. When, when they hear that Canada has a productivity challenge and British Columbia's got a productivity challenge, um, what are the, some of the tools at the disposal of the government that have not already been deployed that you believe could be, uh, could be deployed as we try to ch tackle this issue? And, and what it might mean to us if Yeah, we look, clearly there is a productivity challenge. Our productivity growth in Canada has not been where it needs to be over the past couple of decades. And the truth is we don't entirely know why that is. These are decisions made at the level of the individual firm. 
uh, firms, uh, some firms invest in productivity and others don't, and we don't always know why. I can tell you um, some of the things we're doing to try and grapple with this. Um, in the area of, uh, of manufacturing in particular, we have brought in significant uh, tax incentives, particularly through accelerated capital cost mm -hmm. allowance write-offs on machinery one. and equipment. Yep. And the Canadian dollar is at a high level actually makes that pretty worthwhile. And we are, the s statistics indicate that we are seeing some of those machinery and equipment investments in the manufacturing sector. There are other things we need to do in terms of shifting not just manufacturing but other sectors of the Canadian economy towards, um, I would say, higher end, more highly skilled type uh, occupations and products. Um, that's why we have overhauled our science, technology, research and development mm -hmm. policies at the federal level to try and encourage those investments, encourage commercialization, and why we're trying to affect changes in the Canadian labour market that will direct more people towards you know, some of the skills we know are going to be in demand, things like trades, uh, engineering, sciences and math. Uh, these are the things, these are the broad things we are trying to do and you know, everything I see tells me those are the things we need to do. Um, will those resolve the problem? I don't know for sure because we don't entirely know what the cause of the of the productivity problem is, but uh, I'm optimistic that we're on the right track on that. So we're down to our last. I never, I never meet a business that tells me it's not productive. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we're down to our last kind of 90 seconds here. So I, I, for, I want to take a moment, and uh, this is my, my, my shameless Oprah moment. <laughs> a great game, the Forgotten Leafs. Well, I can understand why. And the rise of, profe I had to say that, I'm a Vancouver guy. The rise of professional, let me congratulate you on the book. I, I, uh, but more, perhaps more urgently, the fact that the, the proceeds of this book go to helping military families, which I think is fantastic. I, I do this not just as a shameless plug for you, but I need to ask you, we got the Canadian Olympic team being picked, I understand tomorrow's the announcement. Give us some predictions, how's it looking for Sochi, how are we gonna do? <laughs> Well, I always told my, uh, I told my staff when I was working on this, part of the reason I worked on a book about hockey 100 years ago <laughs> so is, is so I wouldn't have to express too many opinions about hockey today. I always caution people I could lose more votes by saying the wrong thing about somebody's hockey team than just about anything else that could possibly come out of my mouth. Um, I, I did have the opportunity recently to meet with... Uh, uh, Mike Babcock and others uh, connected with the uh, Canadian Olympic team and I know they're putting a lot of thought into this. Um, you know, we have an interesting situation as uh, Canadians. We're, we're going to face very intense competition at the Olympics. The uh, Americans, the Russians, the Swedes, a couple of others, but those in particular are going to have very strong teams that um, you know, man for man on paper look as good as anything we're going to put down. The difference is, as, as they were telling me, is that if you look at the top 20 Canadian players, stack them up against the 20 from those countries, they're, they're pretty comparable. But if you look at the next 20, if you were to have a, a tier two competition, Canada would sweep that. For those other teams, it's obvious who you will put on your mm -hmm. team. For our team, it's not as obvious because you've got 40 guys who could fill those 20 positions. Um, what I think they will do, without uh, revealing any secrets, what I think they will do is give a lot of thought to the difference we face in Sochi, which is fundamentally that we're going to be playing on international ice, which is larger, mm -hmm. and which makes the game different. And so I think they will make their final decisions, the decisions at the margins, based on players they think would be more suited for that kind of an environment. But uh, it is going to be a very, uh, very interesting and uh, a very close tournament. Well, on that note, I believe our chair, Elio Luongo, has a special thank you in store for you today. And in turning it over to Elio uh, for a special presentation, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Prime Minister Stephen Harper for his time for this morning. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Elio.